Hello everyone and welcome back to another Babbling Irons video with myself and Sloth today. And it's a managerial breakdown. Uh, we said we wouldn't really touch this subject um, until Moyes' future was confirmed. Again, we still don't know 100% what's going to happen, but we're pretty sure which direction it's heading. Obviously, with, with the talks out there that we're speaking to different managerial candidates, one of those being Ruben Amarim of Sporting. Um, massive, massive stock rise in the past couple of years since he moved to Sporting. And, you know, it, it was it was pretty much set on in, in the media that he'd be going to Liverpool after Alonso turned them down. So that's now not happening. They're going after slot. So Amarin's still in the market. Um, and it would just be really, really... It's an ambitious move, but it would be a really interesting move if we were able to secure it. So we want to provide a breakdown for everyone, of course, as that's what we do. Um, give people a little bit more insight into how he plays, the type of manager he is, and why we think he would be an excellent candidate to replace David Moyes in the summer if we're looking to go that way. So just a little bit of an overview before we get into the breakdown. He's 39, so he's still quite a young manager, um, obviously Portuguese. Um, he actually played as a midfielder um, during his playing career. I think he played for like Benfica and Sporting Braga. Um, since then, he's obviously gone into the managerial position at quite a young age. Um, and he moved to Sporting in 2020 after, I think, like 13 games at Braga where he won 10 of them. So he was snatched up pretty quick by Sporting, you know, four years ago now. Um, and what he was able to achieve there and what he has been able to achieve there has just been absolutely incredible obviously led them to their first uh, league title in around 19, 20 years. Looks like he's going to be on course to do that again uh, this season. So, Amarin, Sloth, just before we get into the breakdown of, you know, the tactical, how he plays, all of this stuff, what are your initial thoughts on Amarin as a manager so far? Wow. Oof, I, 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 why are we even making this video? Because, you know, apparently <laughs> he was flown in to talk to Chelsea and and it yeah. just so happened that it was uh, he, he ended up at the West Ham owner's house. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it, it, look, it's a fantastic link. Um, the fact that he did actually fly in to, to meet West Ham is um, something that I think is, is a real statement. And whether it's um, something that you view as a negative in terms of perhaps maybe putting Moyes' nose out of joint um, or maybe a bit disrespectful towards um, sporting as well. Not that uh, we have a very good history with, uh, you know, certain elements of sporting. Um, yep. is, is That's entirely down to you. But in terms of him as a manager, I think it's a fantastic um, potential move. I'm, I'm could wax a lyrical about him and you know we've been speaking to to our, our i feel like a, a news reporter is like our man out in portugal <laughs> yes. um uh friend of the channel robbie and yep. um he has he is a sporting um admirer and he is far more knowledgeable than than just someone who's watched them on the telly um he's been in and around the club and and he is someone else who is cannot speak highly enough about the manager and yeah it's it's really something that i think it's a bit of a change of style but it would be quite a easy transition which will expand on why but also something that when people say oh he tends to play a back five it doesn't doesn't touch that much on yeah how he uses it and why it, why it's slightly different to what many west ham fans might be thinking yeah, hundred percent. It's 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 a completely different outlook on the on the black the back five that we're probably used to seeing uh, where Moyes utilizes it. So, yeah, just before we get into that, so just as context, uh, he's a manager that likes to play youth. He likes to promote within, and he's a very very good coach. And he gets the best out of these players when they're developing. And the average squad age of sport in this season is is just over twenty five. You compare that to West Ham, it's just under twenty nine. So. We do have a very decaying old squad. So that is maybe a little bit of not a concern, but something that he would have to address. And it's going to be the same for any manager, but he's not scared to promote within, which is uh, which is really good to hear for, for fans that want to see the youth coming through at West Ham um, as well. And a couple of things from this season, obviously Gokarez was a player that, you know, I know you stuff as well last summer when we sat here doing these transfer rumors. He was one that came up. We really wanted him at West Ham. And he's gone on and absolutely smashed it at Sporting. Uh, he's got 26 goals so far in the league, which is the top goal scorer. 
Um, and they've also got Gonçalves, who's uh, top, of their, top of the assists for the league with 12 assists. So they're definitely doing something right. Um, and I think Amarin definitely is playing a big part of that. So let's start with the tactical setup. And, you know, you mentioned there playing that kind of back three, back five. So it is very flexible. Um, this is kind of how it looks as a flat structure. If you're looking at it, you know, on your on your lineup builder or whatever before a match, it's kind of a 3-4-3, three, three, a 5-2-2-1, two, two, however you want to kind of dress it up. Um, so he will, it, will, it will be very flexible. The, the base is kind of a 3-4-3 three, three when, when, when it, uh, kind of transitioning and 5-2-3 during defense and kind of bringing everyone together very clustered in um, when defending if he needs to be in quick in transition. Um, what is interesting about this kind of setup of Amarin, um, and our, again, good friend Robbie, massive shout out to him. We'll leave his link in the description. Um, gave us some really good insight into this one is he is extremely, extremely flexible with the formations that you're going to see on this screen. It's not set in stone at all. Very much similar to the likes of Chabi Alonso, who's coming through. You know, it's, it's very much you get to a certain point with a structure and then there's certain things in the final third that, that can really hurt teams. And that's something about Amarin, you know, really, really important to get across. The flexibility allows Amarim to be fast in transition if they need to play counter-attacking, if they need to sit off teams in moments. But they're also very, very comfortable at being a possession-based team, being being the team that's expected to dominate a match and breaking through teams, you know, not stagnating when they get into the final third. So he's kind of looked at both areas and, you know, you do require certain players to play that fast transition, you know, Kudus, Bowen being prime examples of, of David Moyes' success in that system. But what Amarin does have is the flexibility to actually dominate a game in terms of possession and, you know, find those routes of success into the final third because we tried it last season uh, and it didn't work out for Moyes uh, as well. So that's definitely a benefit. Just looking at that as a whole, uh, Slough, does that fill you with a little bit more confidence? And would you say his his flexibility is maybe one of his top traits as a manager at such a young age as well, 39? 100%. I think... Uh, he he showed a really good example of this at the weekend as well when uh, Sporting went 2-0 down to Porto and it was his tactical changes, mixing things on, uh, uh, bringing Jokerez on uh, that actually was a big impact. You know, it got them a draw in the end, it got them a point. And, you know, we've been very critical of some of um, Moyes' tactical changes uh, we, in recent weeks. Um, this is the sort of thing that I think a lot of West Ham fans are crying out for someone who is proactive and willing to make those calls whether it's in the um you know the 45th minute the 60th minute or even if it's say late on it's it's someone who has got the eye and can say right this is what we need to do and in the case of um at the weekend against Porto it was a player who isn't going to get bullied by um Porto's big muscular strong center backs they're going to yeah. put up a fight they're going to create space and one of the things that Robbie was really keen to, to talk about was that um, his attackers, he's really keen on this approach of defending from the front and pressing and creating these overloads. Now, the part of the reason that Jokerez has got so many assists this season is because he is working hard, he's pressing, he's winning back the ball, but also he's creating space for the players around him. And whether that is the lightning pace of uh, people like um Edwards or Gonzalez, it's it's the uh, fact that they can, you know, win a knockdown and then they know that someone's going to be there. And that's it, also like a positive for why if he was to come to West Ham, you know, our, our game has been tailored for how long, Slough, around having that fixated Antonio figure at striker. It almost feeds straight into that, doesn't it? Like you mentioned, Gokarez being the one that's creating the space and, you know, having that physical presence, who's also fast but can hold up the ball and is clinical in front of goal. That type of profile he would probably be looking at as well. So if Antonio is to stay probably as a sub uh, going forwards with his age, he kind of fits that profile almost perfectly. Yeah, definitely. And I think the key, one of the key things as well is that he really has an eye for players. We'll, we'll uh, expand upon that a little bit more. But when you look at West Ham and, you know, you look at the quality we have up top, players like Kudus, players like Bowen and Antonio, if if you can take that and add a couple of players that he's, he's really shown an eye for um, Sporting's recruitment, if you can add maybe three attackers with a lot of pace, the ability to work hard and create those um, overloads. It's it's a chance to really wear down defences mm. and keep the intensity high for the attack across the 90 minutes. 
and someone like Kudus, who we know is incredibly mobile, incredibly physical, and likes to take people on, they'll thrive in that sort of system. Yeah. It's, um, it's something really that is exciting to watch, but also you just know full well that if you're going to um, soak up all this pressure, you've got that outlet, you've got players who will just suddenly be able to create a chance yeah. and take someone on. And we've complained at times about how um, our forwards can be so isolated. What's really good about Amon's play is that he's really keen on creating patterns and getting all these attackers to work together, stay close to one another and not just rely on a moment of quality or a counter attack to make something happen. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, just touching on that, this is probably how you'd see a sporting uh, team look in, you know, in terms of how they're shaped. Again, it's not 100% because they're moving all the time. But you mentioned there Gokarez, you know, being that focal figure. This is kind of how they're trying to suffocate you if they're trying to play possession base. You know, you've got those three centre backs um, in that back three pushing very, very high up. There's a huge emphasis on the middle two in this in this system in terms of high risk, high press, high reward. So what they'll do is one will often be the sitter, which you can see in front of the back three there. And the other one's moving from left to right, finding the pockets of space to link with the both kind of inverted forwards either side of Gokarez. And then you've got your full backs or wing backs, should I say, providing that width and trying to provide those overloads um, from those kind of inside forwards as well. So Gokarez would you know, Gokrez has absolutely crazy support from the players around him in this system, especially when they've got possession. Um, and it's probably why he's sat on 26 goals in a league and what 40 goals in all competitions this season already. A large factor is obviously down to the player himself and his finishing ability, but a lot of it comes from the structure. And, you know, we've said it so many times. We've had strikers over the years that we just haven't been able to put into the correct system to feed them goals. Skamaka was a prime example of that. Sebastian Haller was a prime example of that. You know, you need... The setup has to be correct for the type of profile. Antonio does a really, really good job in this David Moyes team because the way we play is very isolated, like you mentioned. And Antonio, with his strength, with his, you know, industrial ability to run the channels and keep the ball and, you know, basically feed transitions is different to what Amarin will will demand if, we, if we're trying to play in possession. Um, however, with the transitions, what is slightly different as well that, that Robbie alluded to, which was a really important point, we're currently relying on someone like Kudas to take two or three players on in that transition. You know, we're relying on that kind of moment of brilliance from someone to, or, uh, you know, a wonderful pass from Paqueta to break the line suddenly uh, for Antonio or Bowen. We're, we're relying on a, a few different individual factors. If we're, you know, basically transitioning under Amarim and we're kind of sitting off a little bit, you know, inviting the pressure almost intentionally, and then we're breaking. A lot of the time, Amarim won't require a player to beat three or four players like Kudas does. It'll be, okay, we're going to bomb up the pitch. We're going to create overloads. We're going to transition fast. And there's going to be options and supply for the demand. It's not going to be one person trying to take on three players. So that's a big difference for how we transition. Um, and also, as we showed you just then, in possession, so many bodies around, you know, the, the biggest concern, not concern, but if he was to come into West Ham right now is we've seen before how open our midfield gets, you know, when we're, when we're trying to play that expansive football. With Amarin's system, the middle two, have there's so much demand on him. And we've seen with Alvarez, he can't play for 90 minutes of that intensity. Um, you know, will he be able to do it as he develops under Amarin? I'm not so sure. Who would you play there as the second centre mid? Would would we have to sign someone else to play alongside Alvarez to to be that person who's getting between the lines? Because we've seen with Suchek, he's not a ball to ball to feet player. Um, War Prowse again is not someone that is you know going to make things happen between the lines. He's very comfortable behind the lines um, or in front of the lines. Um, and then I don't know who else you got. Calvin Phillips who won't be around. So are we going to need to sign that second profile to fit this Amarin system to to play alongside Alvarez in that midfield too? Well, look, uh, we, we've been very vocal about needing more quality in that midfield for, for seasons now. You know, we even were speaking about uh, Wharton for, for a long time. And you look at the sort of perfect partner for Alvarez in that system. He is it. But look, we're not going to sit here and say we should go out and sign him because 
this is not going to happen. You know, yeah. Crystal Palace aren't going to sell to us. Um, but there's tons of great athletic mobile players out there who can create a physical um, imposing, uh, like they can be physically imposing on the opposition and they're good with their feet. It's great having Suchek um, and you know he's going to put in the work rate. But when you need someone who's going to retain the ball and be able to turn a man and get away from them, create that space for the overload, then it's it's not going to be him, I'm afraid. Yeah. So there's players like Manu Kone out there who are who's rumoured to be available for under 30 million euros. You've got Yusuf Fafana, who's in the last year of his contract at Monaco. Now, these are players who lots of uh, sides are going to be after. But yeah. even if you want to look domestically, you know, you've got players like Hackney at uh, Middlesbrough. Yeah. And it's it's just about us having the 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 eye for that recruitment. And one thing that's really good about Amorim is that in the last few seasons under him, you know, Sporting have sold a lot of players. They've sold over 300 million euros worth of, of, yeah. of talent. But you look at the job that he's done to take Sporting from you know, being very much the outer, um, the outer team. They're not quite the Spurs of uh, of Portugal, but you know, they hadn't won a title in 19 years before Amarin came in. Yeah, and he's now got them competing. He knocked Arsenal out the Europa Cup the other year. He's got them back in Europe, looking confident, looking comfortable, and really pushing in Portugal. Really, really competing at the top. So. You can't underestimate the job he's doing in recruitment. And I think that's going to be one thing that if we do want to make this change, someone like Suchek, players like James Will Prowse, they're going to be fantastic for a squad. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're going to be the sort of players starting under Amarim. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And, you know, just to just to touch on that as well, you know, he has been so good at developing his squad you know through the transfers he's made you know and, and he's also lost out you know he's had to sell a lot of players as well um obviously their their model is based on that um but again i'm just gonna i, I mean he's lost notable players in that time you know look at nunu mens and ugarte who are at psg right now obviously pedro porro at spurs uh Polinho, who went to fulham nunez who went to wolves um but like the transfers he made during his time at Sporting, you know, Gonsalves, who we mentioned, is top assist this season. Polina at the time, Ugarte, uh, Marcus Edwards, who, you know, obviously came from Tottenham. Pedro Porro, Gokarez, you know, St. Just. There's, there's so many players that he's brought in and developed as well, um, which is a massive credit to how he plays and how he coaches. And again, it's not just looking with outside, it's also within, you know, he's very good at promoting youth. Um, he plays, he, oh, excuse me, he plays as a, a big, strong um importance on developing youth and you know five of his starting 11 right now are 25 years or uh, of age or younger um so there's definitely there's definitely an exciting project there for him if he wants to take the west ham job it's just whether we can get it over the line i think um this is probably the only time we'll be able to make it happen because his stock's only going up and you know he's only becoming more of a european um attraction to a lot of the big clubs so I think we'll live, with Liverpool missing out on him, this is the time to strike. We have to try and go all out to make this happen because it would be an outstanding appointment. It really would. If if Tim Steiden and, and co could pull this off, if we are looking to change manager, it would be incredible. Um, it really, really would. It, it, we can't understate how big of an appointment this would be for the football club. Um, and I think he's probably the perfect man to be part of that rebuild because... Again, we, we've said it so many times on this channel, but it's going to be a massive, massive rebuild this summer. We're going to need to make between like eight to 10 signings just to compete and, you know, uh, kind of weigh out the outgoings and and reduce that age squad, aging squad. And obviously we're going to have to look at youth. I think we're kind of forced now to look at youth and promote promote within and give those young players like George Erfie, even Freddie Potts coming back from loan, maybe a chance in pre-season. Uh, to impress the new manager and maybe try and integrate them into the Premier League next season. So, what is there anything that concerns you with Amarin? Is there anything that's maybe saying, mm, I'm not too sure about this, or are you kind of really positive about the move if it was to happen? Um, I, I'm really positive about it. I think, look, it's 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 one thing for, for me to sit here and go, I think Gary O'Neill would be a great appointment because yeah. that's that's obvious, you know, that's that's easy for me to say. And I think Vincent Company showed some really exciting um, ideas. 
whether you can implement them at Burnley is a totally different thing, uh, topic of discussion. Yeah. But what I would say to, to a lot of West Ham fans who have this reservation about, about being a stepping stone or, you know, that they view a lot of managers coming into the job as, you know, they view it as the next step. That it's 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 a an interim job that they can come into for a few years, and if they smash it, they'll go up to the next level. Yeah. Well, that's what we want to do. You know, that's what we want to do in total. Uh, it's it's we want to take the club further. And if you've got someone like Amoim who's going to come in and do a similar job to someone like um, Alonso at Leverkusen, are you going to say no to that? Are you yeah. really going to say no to someone who's going to push you further? And look, I'm not saying we're ever going to go unbeaten in the Premier League or anything like that. But if this manager can come in, get you a season in the Champions League, then get you a, or, or get you a Europa Cup that takes you into the Champions League. Yeah. You're not going to say no to that. I'm sorry. It, 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 even if he leaves in the next couple of seasons, if you get that time under a manager, you're not going to turn that down because the game has changed so much. I think as well, like uh, right now, uh, most West Ham fans are probably going to be a little bit more patient. Like we've won the European Europa Conference League. We've had huge success in Europe the past few years. And, you know, what the, the games we've played and even in the league, we've had great success. So I think fans might be a little bit more lenient, a bit more accepting over the next couple of years okay, saying, OK, this is a project. It's going to take time to develop. It might be a couple of steps backwards before we go forwards again and, you know, start playing in the semifinals of Europa League. But we know and we trust the process of what's happening and, and developing the club overall. So I think because of this recent success we've had, it almost gives the next manager a little bit more time to to kind of implement their, their self in the club because Moyes has also been here for four years now, which in current uh, er, modern era terms is quite a long time for a manager. But I think the kind of main key considerations around Amarin, uh, if he was to come in, is this, there is going to be significant change required um, because he needs a highly mobile squad with pace. And we've said we are probably one of the slowest teams in the league across the board, especially defensively. Um, so that's going to that's going to be a massive change if he does come in and something that needs to be addressed. We're obviously going to need to be reinforcing that defence with at least another ball playing centre back. You know, Aguerd's likely to leave. Um, Zuma, again, is again probably going to be a squad player or likely to leave which leaves you with Mavropanos and Ogbonna. Ogbonna's probably going to get the extension, but he won't be playing. So it wouldn't surprise me if Amarin kept Aguerd to play in that back three on the left side, because I think he would actually suit it really well. Um, and and Mavropanos on the other side, and he might want to try and bring in someone like a Kilman to, to be in, in, involved in that squad on the left-hand side if we need two options, uh, or another kind of central centre-back like Anasio. But yeah, there's, those are kind of the main things for me. Um, that we need to be careful of. Um, and obviously, Antonio isn't getting any younger. That 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 signing is going to be so crucial for Amarim in, in that central, in that focal point up front. Whether he brings Gokarez with him for 100 mil, um, I don't know. Very unlikely. But that type of player is going to be needed at West Ham. I think regardless of whether Amarim comes in or not, you know, we need a striker that's going to kind of suit that model and, and be able to adapt to both counter-attacking and holding up the ball as well. So... Plenty of considerations. Um, out of 10, how high would you rate Amarim as a manager and how highly would you rate it if it was an appointment for West Ham? Look, I, I think he's been really impressive at um, sporting. And I think when you look at the job he's done, I think he's done a 10. As as we said, you know, he's taken a team who hadn't won a title in 19 years and not only got them winning stuff, he's got them competing at the, in Europe and, you know, knocking out teams like Arsenal. Mm -hmm. So... I think any West Ham fan would be happy with that. Um, in terms of my own happiness with it, it's definitely a 10. I think yeah. it's between him and Fonseca for me in terms of who I would pick. But in terms of who I think the board will pick, you know, it's a, it's that is a much easier question <laughs> yeah. to answer. Yeah, no, I think we're, uh, our next video will probably be on Fonseca, um, which you should definitely check out for in the next few days. But yeah, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see how this one evolves. Um, obviously, he came over for talks. There was a the big story about how he said he was sorry for doing it. Not that he was sorry for meeting West Ham, sorry how the timing happened and how he did it. So I definitely think there's something here. Uh, there's definitely something we can do here with Tim Steiden, um and co kind of, spearheading this um as well so 
it's going to be really interesting. Um, again, massive shout out to Robbie for the information as well for on sporting uh, that he provided as well. That definitely helped with our analysis. Um, and yeah, if you enjoyed the analysis, let us know in the comments. Uh, make sure to leave a like, like on the video if you did enjoy it um, and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're new. Um, yeah, we're going to do another breakdown, uh, managerial breakdown on Fonseca, um, you know, in a few days and any other managerial links. Maybe we do one on Lopetegui uh, as that one's probably more likely to evolve than the other <laughs> the other two names mentioned. But, um, it would be, uh, could be a hotbed for the comments. <laughs> yeah. It's not very popular, yeah. is he? no he's not um but yeah we, we'll we'll get onto that at the time if we need to um yeah make sure to leave a like on the video subscribe to the channel and sloth until next time come on you come eyes, on you eyes.